feeling, cognition, formation, and consciousness. There are 51 dharmas belonging to the mind. They comprise the two skandhas of feeling and cognition. The skandha of formation consists of the 24 non-interacting dharmas. In addition, there are the six unconditioned dharmas. Together, they make up 100 dharmas. Maitreya Bodhisattva transformed all the teachings of Shakyamuni Buddha's lifetime into 660 categories of dharma. Since 660 categories were still too many, later on, the Bodhisattvas Vasubandhu and Asanga summarized them into 100 dramas. The verse says, All dramas are empty of characteristics, lacking a nature of their own. In other words, the five skanda dramas form feeling, cognition, Formation and consciousness are all empty. They have no nature of their own. Their substance is empty, not produced, not destroyed. They silently pervade. Naga Indruna Bodhisattva recited a verse of several lines which explains in detail the dramas of production and extinction. How did he put it? Birth in the past is not birth. Birth in the future is not birth either. Besides birth in the past and birth in future, there is birth in the present, and that is no birth. Birth in the past is not birth. When birth has already taken place, how can there still be birth? Take, for example, a tree. Once a tree has sprouted, you cannot say it will sprout again. Birth in the future is not birth either. If there is no birth for the, the already born, the not yet born has not been born either, has it? How can it have a birth if it still has not been born? Besides birth in the past and birth in the future, there is birth in the present and that is no birth. There is birth in the present and that is no birth. It is the same principle as the past mind cannot be obtained the present mind cannot be obtained, and the future mind cannot be obtained. Thus, uh, Naga Juna Bodhisattva made clear the doctrine of no production and no extinction. This expression of the theory is quite complete. The drama spoken by the Buddha has eight characteristics. No production and no extinction no permanence and no annihilation, no unity and no differentiation, no coming and no going. With his four line verse, Naga Juna Bodhisattva described birth. Extinction can be described in the same way. Extinction in the past is not extinction. Extinction in the future is not extinction either. Besides extinction is the past and extinction in the future. There is extinction in the present and that is no extinction. When such a doctrine is proclaimed, most people are not very clear about it. That is the reason I never talk about this kind of doctrine. Nevertheless, now I will talk about no production and no extinction. Not produced, not destroyed, they silently pervade not defined, not pure. They are separate from corrupting filth. Our fundamental nature is without defilement or purity. But as soon as we are born and become pupil, there is defilement and purity. Yet the defilement and purity are not defined and not pure. Nonetheless, as pupil, we have the kind of nature which is attached to accounting for things in a one-sided manner and so we say, this is defined and that is pure. It is our attachment nature which causes the change to defilement and purity. How can we say that? It is the way that our minds become attached. Take, for example, our hands. Sometimes, in particular circumstances, hands become smeared with various kinds of excrement. For instance, human excrement or pig's excrement. Why your hands are smeared with it? You think they are very filthy, but once you have washed them off with water, you consider them clean. However, if you use a washed cloth with cement or some other impure substance on it, 
you still feel that it is unclean after even after you have finished washing it with soap. You feel that if the washcloth has touched the excrement or become smeared with it, you cannot get it clean, so you throw it out. Even though the washcloth has been washed, you always feel in your mind that it is not clean. But after people wash their hands with water, their minds are not attacked in the same way. They don't talk about taking a knife and cutting off a hand to get rid of it, nor wanting it because it is not clean. But why is the hand considered clean when the washcloth isn't? Is that you can't get rid of your hand, so your mind considers it clean. If it were not clean, you still could not give it up and throw it out. But even when the washcloth is washed clean, you don't want it, nor do you wish to rub your face with it. As soon as you rubbed it on your face, you would feel that the stench had been rubbed into your face. Originally, there was excrement wrapped in the washcloth, so in your mind, you do not want it. It is too unclean, yet it is all in your mind. If there is not that kind of attachment in your mind, then there is no defilement and no purity. When the attachment is made to disappear, the state is reached where not defied, not pure. They are separated from corrupting filth. If your mind does not have that kind of attachment, there is no problem. For even when there is filth, filth is just the same as purity. The original substance of one's own nature is neither defined nor pure. Therefore, all is without characteristics and originally has no defilement or purity. If you are capable of attaining the principle of the way of neither defilement nor purity, so that your mind is not affected by defilement and purity, you will unite with your nature. Your virtue will equal that of heaven and earth, and your light, that of the sun and moon. How can the Buddha be like infinite suns? Because the Buddha was able to attain the principle of the way of neither defilement nor purity. If you are capable of attaining this kind of natural principle of the way, which is neither defined nor pure, you and the four seasons, spring, summer, fall, and winter, have all been united and transformed into one. You can be united with the auspiciousness and misfortune of gods and ghosts. Why are you unable to accomplish this? Because you have a kind of nature which is attached to accounting for things in a one-sided manner. If you didn't, you could return to the original source and so leave defilement. They neither increase nor diminish, enlighten the dark and mysterious middle. When you have attained enlightenment, there is neither increase nor decrease in your nature. You have become enlightened to the most subtle and wonderful nominal substance of the middle way. I spoke earlier about Nagarjuna Bodhisattva and the doctrine of non-production which he proclaimed. I also mentioned the drama of the eight characteristics explained by the Buddha during the Vaikulya period. No production and no extinction, no permanence and no annihilation, no unity and no differentiation, no coming and no going. Most people are attached either to annihilation or to permanence. Annihilation and permanence are the views of external paths, but the Dharma which was spoken by the Buddha is neither annihilationism or nor eternalism. It is a Dharma of neither unity or differentiation. Let's talk about us. Would you say that people are annihilated? When people die, do they then not exist? Or would you say that people live eternally? If so, then why don't we see any people from ancient times right now? We don't see them because people don't live forever. Would you say then that people do not live eternally? The rights which 
we now eat is the same rice which the ancients ate. The rice has not been annihilated. If you say that it has not been annihilated, you must say that it is eternal. The ancients are not eternal, but we are eternally eating the rice the ancients ate. Since we eat it, how is it still eternal? We eat it all the time. Therefore, the Dharma spoken by the Buddha is neither annihilationism nor eternalism. So you should not be attached either to a view of annihilationism or to a view of eternalism. You should unite instead with the middle way. And so the verse says, enlighten the dark and mysterious middle. No coming and no going. The Buddha, the first come one, does not come from anywhere or go anywhere. You should not only mention the first come one, since we people also neither come nor go. You may say that there is a coming, but where do people come from? You don't know. You may say that there is a going, but when we die, where do we go? You don't know that either. No coming and no going. There is nowhere that we come from and nowhere that we go. In other words, there is neither unity nor differentiation. The lack of unity means there is no sameness, and the lack of differentiation means there are no two different characteristics. That is, there is no characteristic of commonality and no characteristic of distinction. Would you say that there is a characteristic of commonality? Let's talk about the body. The body is not just composed of one kind of thing that is organized to become a body. There are many different divisions. That is what is meant by no unity and no differentiation. Generally speaking, the body is just a body when there isn't any other distinction made. That is what is meant by no differentiation. No, to explain this kind of principle is very complicated. One time a little is said and the next time a little is said. When it has been talked about several more times, you will be able to understand. They neither increase nor diminish. One's own nature neither increases nor decreases. In the pure and deep ultimate silence, all creation is transcended. Being very, very pure, one transcends the creative and transformative processes of heaven and earth. A sudden awakening to the original perfect fusion of self and dharmas. If you are able to understand simultaneously all the various principles which have been expounded, you will suddenly awaken to the fact that self and dharmas are originally perfectly fused, unobstructed, non-dual, and undifferentiated. Self and dharmas are one. There is a Chinese saying which is very helpful in understanding that they neither increase nor diminish. The years and months are unfeeling in increase in its decrease. One cannot say that the years and months have any human feelings at all. All that is mentioned is that they are increasing is a decreasing. If it is said that there is neither increase nor decrease, how then is there increase and decrease nonetheless? What increases and decreases also neither increases nor decreases. The years and months are unfeeling, you say. I don't want to go. You stand here today wanting to stop the flow, saying, Tom, don't accompany me any further. You wish to tell it not to go past, but unless you make the sun stand still, no matter what you do, you will not stop it from flowing. Now, although science has made progress, it still has found no method capable of making the sun stand still. There, therefore, time is unfeeling. In increase is decrease. This year we are 60 years old. The next year, 61 years old. Although it may seem that our lifespan has increased by one year, if you can give later with the year of death, for instance, if I were to die at the age of 100 and have now lived to be 61, there would still remain 39 years. My life would have already decreased to 39 years. 
Therefore, when one side increases, the other side decreases. In increase is decrease. So also in decrease is increase. If you really understand this principle, you know that there is basically neither increase nor decrease. When I was teaching you Chinese, I said, if you do not have an old heart, you have eternal youth. Therefore, in increase is decrease. What should be done? Test the Buddha Dharma after the bitter, the sweet. The Buddha Dharma is really most flavorful. When you study the Buddha Dharma, you study a little bit and then you understand a little bit. Recently, I said, regarding becoming enlightened, there are small enlightenments, there are middle-sized enlightenments, and then great enlightenments. How big is a small enlightenment? Perhaps it is as small as a speck of dust bordering on emptiness. In the field of your eighth consciousness, you have already had a small enlightenment, and you still do not know it. When you have a middle-sized enlightenment, you feel, Ah, I understand a little more of the doctrine. That is what neither increase nor diminish is basically about. Fundamentally not produced, not destroyed, not defined, not pure, has so many meanings. You understand the meaning of those doctrines. That is middle-sized enlightenment. Great enlightenment ends in birth and death. You know how you come and how you go. You know that uh, what is meant by increase or decrease and by not produced and not destroyed. That's great enlightenment. Testy Buddha Dharma. After the bitter, the sweet. First, you certainly must endure a little bit of suffering. That does not mean to study for three and a half days or even five days and then to say, I have studied enough Buddha Dharma. No, you certainly should let go of that sort of patience. Get rid of it and say, no matter what difficulty I want to learn. This is why we stick to an unvarying schedule of language and sutra study. Unless there are special situations, I absolutely won't be lazy about teaching you. Why? It is just that you must reliably Truly cultivate, and then you can get to the flavor. After the bitter, the sweet. You must first take the bitter, and afterwards you can obtain what is sweet. So, in studying the Buddha Dharma, no one should be afraid of suffering. Don't be afraid. The more suffering, the better. You should get up your energy, firm your stance, direct your will, and go forward with vigor and valor. You shouldn't be afraid of suffering. You shouldn't be afraid of difficulty. And you can study the Buddha Dharma. The Emptiness of the Eighteen Fields Sutra, therefore, in emptiness there is no form, feeling, cognition, formation, or consciousness. No eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, or mind. No sights, sounds, smells, tastes, objects of touch, or dharmas. No field of the eyes up to and including no field of mind consciousness. Verse. Therefore, in emptiness there are no characteristics of form. Feeling, cognition, formation, and consciousness disappear also. As well as the six faculties and six objects together with six consciousnesses. With three minds in three seasons, three closures are passed through. The great cause of white ox turns with the sound lean lean. A little yellow face tried drums and thumbs in agitation. What instructive meaning is there in this? The front double three and the back double three meet. Commentary Therefore, in emptiness there is no form. This sentence refers back to an earlier passage in the sutra. Not produced, not destroyed, not defied, not pure. And they neither increase nor diminish, since that is the case in emptiness. True emptiness, there is no form, no feeling, cognition, formation, or consciousness. The basic substance is also empty. No eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, or mind. 
None of the six perceptual faculties exist. No sight, sounds, smells, tastes, objects of touch, or dramas. The six objects of perception do not exist either. No field of the eyes, absolute and including no field of mind consciousness. All the six consciousnesses are also empty. The Heart Sutra speaks about the true emptiness of prana. The true emptiness of prana is wonderful existence. Wonderful existence is no existence. It is true emptiness. Therefore, it is said, true emptiness does not obstruct wonderful existence, and wonderful existence does not obstruct true emptiness. True emptiness is wonderful existence, and wonderful existence is true emptiness. Earlier, the sutra says, form does not differ from emptiness. Emptiness does not differ from form. The form drama of the five skandhas is empty. The five skandha dramas are a summation of dhammas in general and the others, the six perceptual faculties, the six objects of perception, and the six consciousnesses are special characteristics of dhammas. Since the characteristics of their summation are empty, their special characteristics must be non-existent also. Therefore, the sutra says, there are no eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, or mind, no sights, sounds, smells, tastes, objects of touch, or dramas, no field of the eyes, up to and including no field of mind consciousness. The six objects of perception, the six perceptual faculties, and the six consciousnesses are together called the 18 fields. The six perceptual faculties, together with the six objects of perception, are called the 12 dwellings. The six perceptual faculties are also called the six entrances. There are five skandhas, six perceptual faculties, twelve dwellings, and eighteen fields. The six faculties, six objects, and six consciousnesses, which together comprise the eighteen fields, are all empty also. They do not exist either. Why talk about all these dramas if they do not exist, you ask? They exist among common people, but not where there are sages who have been certified as having as having attained enlightenment. The verse says, "Therefore, in emptiness, there are no characteristics of form, because this principle was stated in the opening paragraph of the sutra." The sutra text now says, "Therefore, in emptiness, there is no form."